unknown to many. The Grand Mosque of Paris. The Grand Mosque of Paris is a wonderful structure on the left bank. It is the central focus of Islam in Paris, and indeed, it is probably the most distinct and important Muslim architectural institution in all of Europe. The Grand Mosque was built in 1926 as a token of gratitude for the 100,000 North African Muslims who fought and died for France in World War I. It is a marvel of design and beauty. But there is another hidden facet of the Grand Mosque, a mysterious legend whispered for decades, but known only to a few. The details of individual cases are very difficult to identify. What are the secrets locked inside the Grand Mosque of Paris? And what role did this house of worship play in one of the most wrenching episodes in modern history. Nine months into World War II, German forces conquer France and set up the Vichy government. The collaborationist regime assists in carrying out Adolf Hitler's Nazi program, which includes rounding up Jews and sending them to concentration camps. To help carry out their plan, the Nazis attempt to recruit local Muslims. The German strategy was to try to reach out to a significant Muslim community in France to try to win them over to the German side. The Germans begin with Kadur ben Gabrit, a well-respected Muslim elder and the head of the Grand Mosque. In public, ben Gabrit is friendly and cooperative with the Nazis. But privately, he is hatching a secret and dangerous plot the Grand Mosque will hide Jews from the Nazis. The mosque gave Jews certificates of Muslim identity. You could pass as Muslim if you had this birth certificate or certificate from the mosque. While some Jews evade detection with the fake documents, the mosque simply doesn't have enough to go around. So Ben Gabrit ratchets things up, this time using the mosque itself. The underground pathways underneath the mosque, which led out to other streets and other neighborhoods, were places where Jews and others were protected. Ben Gabrit's plan to hide Jews in these passageways is soon put to the test. There was one very celebrated testimony from a gentleman uh, named Albert Asulin. Asulin, a North African Jew, escapes from a German prisoner of war camp. After days of traveling in secret, he arrives in Paris and makes his way to the Grand Mosque. But in the Nazi-occupied city, Asseline is far from safe. While he and other Jews are hiding inside, German soldiers suddenly raid the mosque. The mosque would trigger a series of lights that would flash when the Germans were about to enter the premises of the mosque, and Jews would recognize these lights and would find hiding places within the catacombs, behind closet doors. Asulin uses these catacombs to escape, owing his life to the Grand Mosque. But the mosque's commitment to saving Jews is about to face its greatest challenge yet. In wartime Paris, a pop singer named Salim Halali is a big hit in town. Halali was one of the most famous singers of the day. Very known This is like the, the, the Jewish just a, Justin Bieber of the time. Also <laughs> a Jew. And when the Nazis decide to seize him, the Grand Mosque of Paris becomes his last desperate hope for survival. But can the mosque help save one of the most famous men in France? France, the Grand Mosque of Paris. At the height of World War II, the mosque is secretly hiding Jews right under the noses of the occupying Nazis. There was a natural willingness of some of the leaders of the mosque to assist countrymen 
who were facing severe, life-threatening danger because of the Nazi occupation. That danger extends to the Muslims themselves, including the mosque's leader, Kadur Ben Gabrit, who is about to put everything on the line to help save someone seemingly impossible to hide. A famous Jewish, Justin Jewish Bieber. pop singer named Salim Halali. He was Jewish from Algeria. He thought that he would be immune from the Germans because he was so famous. But of course, he wasn't. Muslims are working to save him now. He's the head of the mosque. And yeah. he got word that the Germans were going to come after him. Ben Could have been a Christian, whoever. This is with fake papers a human that being that Muslims Muslim. are trying to save. And then. Ben Gabrit takes an even bolder step. He had a tombstone at the Muslim cemetery outside Paris engraved with Halali's father so that Halali could say when the Germans came after him, see, I'm, I'm, I'm Muslim, I'm not Jewish. Just go check the cemetery. You'll see where my, where my father is buried. Surprisingly, the Nazis are fooled and Halali survives the war. And he, to his dying day, and you can check the obituaries of Halali, thanked Ben Gabrit for saving his life. Ben Gabrit, for his part, keeps silent on the mosque's role in hiding Jews. When he dies in 1954, he is buried in a wall of the mosque, taking the secrets of the rescue mission with him. Today, the Grand Mosque of Paris attracts both worshipers and visitors from all over the world. And its heroic efforts still resonate for all who walk through its doors. It's a story that everybody can appreciate because it's a universal story of rescue and protection at a time of intense danger. And that brings a very faraway culture right at home. As you guys can see, we have a lot to talk about on this week's episode of The Dean Show. Muslims being almost washed out of a lot of the history, but when the history comes to light from not Muslim sources, but from the not yet Muslim sources, you see the truth manifesting. And we're going to be talking about many of those truths on The Dean Show today. And they're based around reviving much of the way the Sunnah of the prophets who were sent to mankind, Jesus, Moses, Abraham, the last of our Messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, that is based on a man's research, a Christian man's research that I'm very interested to know much more about. He wrote a book, and I'm here with a person who is going to tell us more about this book that I'm sure you're going to be interested to find out some of these truths that are mentioned in the book. I'm curious to know. I'm curious to find out. we got a lot to talk about on this week's episode of The Dean Show. This is The Dean, The Dean Show. Salaam alaikum. How are you, Brother Iman? Wa alaikum salam, Eddie. I'm doing well. How are you? We just, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. We just watched the clip we were talking about. It was talking about the Muslims. For the first part... It's very interesting because you know there's a lot of controversy that goes that's happening in, in in Europe today, and there's a lot of hate rhetoric, and you see that there was a mosque that was built particularly in France to honor Muslims for their role that they played to help contribute to saving France, saving Europe, to saving Europe. Right. Talk about this. Let, let's talk. That's that first part, and then we'll get into the other fascinating things that. And I, and I talked about these truths that come out that many people are unaware of that if they were to come out and we're helping to bring them out, this would help to bridge, you know, to foster more of this thing that we should be fostering, peace and unity, instead of this hate that's dividing a lot of us based on a lot of misinformation and, and just people's ignorance uh, about Muslims and Islam. So what do, you, what do you think? What's that mosque that they talked about in France? Great question. So I actually didn't know about this history. I didn't know about the clip, and I met a man by the name of Luke Ferrier. He's a Christian, and his grandfather fought in World War I as a soldier from Belgium. And he essentially, in his encounters with Muslims, he wrote a lot of diary entries about what he thought about Muslims, their honor, their integrity, their respect. So we'll get back into that, but in regards to this specific story, when I met Luke, he started telling me a lot of these fantastical stories. Sometimes almost too good to be true because we forgot in our history. So one of the stories that he shared with me was about North African soldiers who basically were the last line of defense for France, for Paris, 
uh, when the Germans were trying to invade in the World Nazis. War One. No, the Nazis were World War Two. Okay, yeah, yeah. So yeah, this okay. is just a, you know the German forces from World War One, and because of these North African soldiers, they essentially, as Lucas told me, they they were able to stop the Germans from taking over France. Muslims. These were Muslim soldiers. Muslim soldiers, and most of them perished. Some of them survived. But be even the ones that perished, they, there's been a monument, there's been, you know, things that have been built to honor them. But because of the ones that survived, later on they were honored and a mosque was built, as we saw in the video, to honor the, the Muslim and the North African contribution in World War I to saving France. So this mosque is built and uh, the Imam, I believe, at the time of World War II was the son of one of the soldiers from World War I. Now, World War II comes about, the Nazis are invading again, they've come into France. And as we saw in the video, the, the mosque that was built as a token of gratitude from the French to the, to the Muslims of North Africa, now the North African Muslims of, of Paris are using to save people who are Jewish. I mean, what kind of an amazing story is that, right? It's goodness on top of goodness. Diversity, inclusion, working together, humanity. So when, when he told me this, I was astonished. When Luke told me this, I was astonished. I looked for the proof he sent me, uh, you know, I got the book which we have right here. I saw the images, I saw the quotations, and then I saw the Travel Channel clip and I was stunned. I said, why don't we know this? Yeah, that's amazing. You, you, you're seeing the Travel Channel, they're talking about how Muslims are saving human beings. Right. These are human beings. Right. They happen to be Jewish, right. but they could have been Christian or whoever else. But this is all ba based on the teachings of Islam. There's a verse in the Quran, chapter 5, that talks about saving one innocent human being is as, as if you save the world. Mm. So Muslims are doing this because this is what their way of life, Islam, promotes. And this is exactly what uh, Luke's grandfather alluded to in his diary. And this is also why I'm very impressed by a man like Luke Ferrier, someone who is not Muslim. But he has make it, he's made it a mission of his life to preserve our history. And it's a joint history, it's a shared history. But this is something that he's always emphasizing, that we have to learn this history. And he even has a, a portion of the book dedicated towards the teaching of Islam, just a page out of the whole book. But even that page, it clears up a lot of the misconceptions that people have, right? W what Islam is not and what's, what Islam is. And if, if you give me just a brief second, I would like to read... Uh, a translation and the summary of his grandfather's original letter. Is that so okay? this is his gra his uh, grandfather who fought, who, yeah, who was also a devout Christian, who, very devout Christian. As Lucas told me, a very devout Christian, someone who believed in the faith, and um, he his original letter is written in, I believe, Flemish. Yeah. But Luke has translated it, and I have a summary of it. Now this is the difference between, say, a devout Christian who his he's. Uh, He's nourishing what the, uh, there's many Christians who don't espouse on much of this hate rhetoric, right? Uh, Jesus' message of peace and love, and he's, uh, he had a, he made a connection with Muslim. He had that human interaction, yes. right? So this led him now to what you're about to share with us. Y yes. So let me just read it real quick. I have it here on my phone. The translation is, I still cannot figure out why these Muslims from overseas are fighting so fiercely in a war that is not of their concern. They keep referring to their religion and family, traditions of honor and loyalty. Many of them get wounded or die because they never leave someone behind, regardless of culture, race, or religion. We talk a lot about them, happy to have them on our side. Okay, so now this is Luke, the author of this book, his grandfather writing this. Yes. He's writing this about, he's, he's and then Luke finds this. So these writings. let me tell you the story. So Luke never met his grandfather, and I think his story should also be shared because, again, whether he was a Christian, a Jew, a Hindu, a Sikh, it doesn't matter. He was an honest person as far as we know, and he, he, he spoke truthfully, right? So World War II comes around, and Luke's grandfather is actually put into a concentration camp uh -huh. by the Nazis. By the time he gets out of the concentration camp, he's, he's never the same, and he dies shortly after, and Luke actually never got to meet him. So now last year, or I'm sorry, about seven years ago, uh, Luke got interested in this work. He stumbles upon this diary in his attic, and he finds this, this diary full of uh, his grandfather's experiences in World War I, and it's so intense, it's so deep, it's so personal. But what surprises Luke is that his grandfather is talking so positively about Muslims. 
Number one, Luke is surprised. He says, I never knew Muslims partook on the side of the Allies in World War I. And two, there's such positive superlatives, such positive adjectives that his grandfather is using to describe Muslims. So this basically set Luke on a journey where he traveled to, I think, nearly 20 countries. He accessed private collections. He accessed military archives, libraries, basements, attics of people's records of World War I. And he was blown away by the Muslim contribution. Where, where did he get these reports and, and, and uh, these uh, things of documentation that were preserved? They, they're not from Muslim sources. Some of them are. Yeah. A lot of them are military archives uh -huh. from, from the allied countries like you say Germany or France or England. Uh, some of them are people who have them in their private collections. So he, he's made it a life's journey now to get them, authenticate them, digitize them, preserve them. And... He's presented uh, his research at many academic settings. He was at Harvard last year. Yes. Uh, he is going to be at uh, many places in the UK, in Spain, in Dubai, presenting a lot of his findings. But as far as I know and as far as I've seen, uh, a lot of them he's tried very hard to authenticate. Even there is, um, uh, I think the British Army has attested to some of the findings. They even have their own video about Muslim contributions in World War I. So pretty amazing, pretty amazing. Uh, there's a couple of things that. So let's let's go back one. Let's go back a few pages. There was where one uh, this picture right there, right? Yeah, that's 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 the one. Um, there was one before that, but here this is interesting. Uh, on here, where I'll read, uh, it says the reports. This is from his book. The reports and letters mention that Muslim soldiers shared their food with the local people who were suffering from famine in Europe. Mm. So Muslims are feeding the poor even though it's fa famine. And he talks about this despite the fact that they knew it would weaken their own strength needed for the fierce fighting to come. Very interesting. Well, you know, there was a study I think done last year or two years ago. I forgot by which British entity. And it basically said that Muslims were either the most charitable people in the UK or one of the most. This is by the UN. This came out, okay. uh, I think, so last year. Yeah, the UN announced that. Yeah. So now we know we It was Turkey. They, they actually mentioned a co country. It was uh, Turkey, the most charitable. In the world. In the world. But in the UK. In the UK. They were, they, yes. So this yeah. so, and so now think about it. What is it about Muslims that makes us want to give charity? It's our faith. We have uh, many tenets of our faith, many uh, sayings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, many uh, verses of the Quran that talk about the benefits and the virtues of giving charity, right? But now because of uh, also of sincerity, ikhlas as we say in Arabic, it's not something that we necessarily want to talk about. We try to give without expecting anything in return. So now you have someone, a soldier uh, from the subcontinent, as far as I know from his book, that he's in the war, he's in France, the provisions, the rations are going down, but he finds these poor countryside people, these French people, and he's giving some of his daily rations to these people. What, what would make someone do something like this in a time of war? Yeah, why, why would he, if Muslims hate uh, people, <laughs> right. if they're in, in, in that country and they have their own food, many people are just, just greedy, right? right? And they're going off this hadith for the last and final messenger. And that's what I said. This is like reviving the sunnah, the way of all the messengers of Jesus, who we love and revere as one of the mightiest messengers ever sent to mankind, Abraham, Moses. You can't be a Muslim unless you believe and love them. And Prophet Muhammad just being the last and final messenger in, in line to these messengers who, by the way, I mean, as I always mentioned, they came with the same message. Worship the one creator. Nothing's worthy of worship except him. And in the teachings we see, in all their teachings, we see this similarity. And the Prophet Muhammad, when he was asked which charity is the best, he replied, that which is given while you fear poverty. Mm. Wow. So this is given... And being shown, he's illustrating this sunnah, this way in his book. Let, let's correlate this with what his grandfather said. So now we have the hadith, we have the image of the, the, the soldier giving, and then we have what his grandfather said. The honor, the loyalty, the importance of the faith of the Muslims in their daily lives. And um, there's just so many beautiful stories in this book, The Unknown Fallen. One of the other ones that's just very, very impressive to me was the story... Uh, that Luke told me, and it's in the book, about the, the minister of war of France at the time. He basically issued a ruling. He sent out like a, a letter to the, to the army saying that when the Muslim soldier is dying, this is the shahada, this is the testimony of faith, and this is how you say it. If they're dying, 
give them their last rites. So that's Shahada now. Uh, yeah. Don't lose your place. So for, for the not yet Muslims tuning in, that's what someone says to become a Muslim, that they bear witness what's in their nature. There's nothing worthy of worship except the creator of the heavens and earth. And Muhammad, just like Jesus, Moses, and Abraham, was a messenger of God. That's that Shahada, the declaration of faith. That's the testimony. Faith. So they're teaching yeah. now the... Right. Because, you know, when we, when we die, Muslims, we want to have this on our tongue. Yes. Right? And it's something that we say throughout we our lives. We want to live it. We want to have it in our tongues. So we continuously say it. Now, the By continuously saying it, you're conscious of your maker, and that is what's motivating you to be righteous, to be, to be humble, to be a good human being, and give that charity. To help Even others. when you're starving, yes. you're giving it to the people so you can earn your place in paradise. Help people, regardless help. of their background, their creed, their, their differences. You know, we don't hate people. We don't want to harm people. We want to benefit people. Even on, on this show, you do shows now about healthy living. What's the reasoning behind it? Right? Someone could say, this is a show about religion. Why are you talking about healthy living? Without even saying it, I know that for a fact that you tie this to the religion. It goes back, yeah. It goes back to, to, to consciousness of the Creator, to Islam. Okay, yeah. so you have the consciousness, but then why are you sharing it? Why are to you benefit humanity. To benefit to humanity. Benefit. Okay, so similarly here, we have the French Minister of War saying, look, these are our brothers in arms. These are our comrades. They've been loyal. They've done what they're supposed to do. Give them the testimony of faith. This is how you say it. So Luke was sharing a story where you would have priests, rabbis, and imams. They had like an agreement amongst themselves. We're going to give the last rites to the whatever, irregardless of the soldier's faith. This is their last moments on earth. Let's give them their last rites. So that's why for me, this is, uh, as, as, a, as a student of this, and as Luke has also said on behalf of the organization, this is apolitical. This is not about any superpower, not about any country, not about any agenda. For him, as he was touched by the story of his grandfather, he wants to give life to the stories of all these fallen soldiers. Mm -hmm. And this is why he's embarked on this, on this mission. And honestly, it touches my heart that someone has preserved not only Islamic history, Muslim history, but our shared history. I grew up uh, in this country with a lot of Christian friends who helped me a lot. They fed me. You know, we were friends. We go to their houses. They feed you. You're, you're, you're physically in their house. Their parents say nice things to you. You spend time with them. And sometimes we forget about these bonds, right? We, we're not talking about bonding over doing bad things, partying, drinking, and these type of things. But, you know, being kind to each other, helping each other, putting roof over each other's heads, feeding each other. These are, these are honorable things. And sometimes we forget, like look, Luke is a Christian. His grandfather was a Christian. We got to dispel this narrative that uh, people who are not of our faith are bad necessarily, right? Luke is a good person. He's a very good person in my eyes. I never met his grandfather. I thank his grandfather for doing this work, for uh, writing that letter. So in this book, we have so many stories about uh, loyalty, about uh, brotherhood, sisterhood, honor, integrity. There's a story, uh, and there's a picture, I think, in, uh, somewhere around here, about uh, the, the, there's a picture of French nurses, and they're basically standing next to like Muslim soldiers, and they're smiling. So let's put this in picture. Let's put it in perspective. White French nurses with darker North African and darker Indian soldiers with their, you know, Islamic prayer hats and their longer garments. Yeah. And everybody's happy. So this is not in the essence where you have someone compromising their deen, compromising their their loyalty to their creator first and foremost. And now they start like, okay, we'll worship how you're worshiping one day and then we'll flip it the other day. No, these are men who are committed to worshiping the creator, not the creation. I'll but yeah. they're, go ahead. But, they're, but, but, but now when there's justice when they're seeing injustice when they're seeing injustice they're stand they're standing against it when they're seeing people who need food they're feeding them when they uh, what were you going to say so this is like you said not compromising their religion for me this is the point that is not compromising when you see people that need help you help them when you see people are hungry feed them right so now what happens the war is raging people are they've run out of medical supplies as luke has mentioned in the book and as he's told me in person and what do you have you have the, the, he says, the Indian Muslims and the North African Muslims sharing their knowledge of herbal medicine with the French nurses. And in turn, the French nurses were able to save more lives because they ran out of supplies. Mm -hmm. So now you just have good feelings. You have respect, honor. You have a lot of the French, British, allied uh, dignitaries, a lot of the, the uh, members of the, the, the community at the time honoring Muslims for their contributions, right? So we have to rep remember and preserve this history. Uh, and I just think that, look, there's so many stories. There's a, there's a picture in the book 
of a Christian soldier and a Muslim soldier like arm in arms. This is beautiful. This is beautiful. And you see that when the people were in the trenches, your real self comes out. And this is why the non-Muslim soldiers, they, they honor the Muslim soldiers because they saw that a lot of them were people of value, people of honor. On the same side, we have to also appreciate, like look, we have to appreciate someone who is not a Muslim but is helping us preserve our history. Mm -hmm. So how would you have someone's thinking like, okay, you see a Christian soldier and a Muslim uh, soldier. There's that, there's that, that movie. It's, it's very, it was very um, uh, popular where you had the uh, communist coming in to invade. What was the name of it? They were coming to invade uh, America. And um, it's a very popular uh, movie. And then you had, uh, you know, you had the people who are coming together to fight off the foreign invaders. Mm. So now just painting a picture, like let's say you had communist China coming to attack America. Now this is a good vision where Muslims would stand together side by side, you know, yes. to, to defend and to protect, right? I, I, would, I would hope and believe yeah, so. Absolutely. You know, and there's also, like he mentioned in his research, I don't know if the number was, it was a couple of thousand. But there were a couple of thousand American Muslim soldiers that served for America in World yeah. War One. Yeah. You know, so you had, they said, millions of soldiers worldwide for the Allied side. Yeah. Hundreds of thousands from North Africa, hundreds of thousands from India, uh, uh, 5,000 or so um, Muslim soldiers, or maybe a little bit less from the United States. So you have so many of these yeah. stories. And these people were Muslims still. But Islam is totally against an oppression of a people, being on the side of oppressors. No, no, no. We cooperate in goodness. Yeah, and, and if and there's a just righteous cause, Islam are part of it. Right, and this story again. See, one thing again, I'm going to reiterate: this is not a political story. This is not a story of any country, any organization. This is the preservation of the stories and lives of soldiers. The book is called "The Unknown Fallen." Uh -huh. Why is it they're, they're unknown? And we're just trying to preserve yeah. their history so that is shared and known. So I want I want uh, you the audience to look into this. I'm curious to know because we should be learning uh, history, we should be knowing so a lot of these things don't repeat themselves and we can benefit. So I'm curious to know what you guys have to say, what you think, get involved in the conversation and we're bringing this to you to light to spark a conversation because when you look at and, and, and this is also to help motivate that good that's in all of us. We're all born, as we believe as Muslims, with that original goodness. Good from the get-go, from the start. But when you see it's it's sad to watch. You recently, not too long ago, you had one of the largest marches in history in, in Poland, Warsaw, I believe, where they were pretty much... The slogans were "Pray for a Islamic Holocaust." Mm. Did you hear about this? Yes, sixty thousand people came together under the banner now of "We are Christian," but this does not represent Christianity. Of course not. So you mm. have this element that's out there, and under the disguise of Christianity, and now they obviously also don't know this history they don't know really what islam is about you have a researcher someone who's not christian i mean not muslim he's christian his father was a devout christian and now he's talking about jihad he's talking he talks about jihad mm. in this book isn't it let's mm. talk about that for a second i think that was it's uh, earlier yeah around page so 24. now this is someone who is sincere he's a christian he's doing his research he's not just going off hate rhetoric and ignorance and what does he conclude? What's he talk about? He, it's uh, page right here. He mentions some facts that we would agree with 100%. And if we motivate those Christians, Jews, people just who really want to know, come to a Muslim, come to, come to really investigate and know. He mentions these facts. Can you talk about that? This is mentioned in his book. Um, so point number six, he says, it is forbidden in Islam to kill the innocent. Point number non -combatants. seven. Non-combatants. Right. Because I've heard people argue like, oh, innocent, innocent Muslims. Right. They, 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 no, this is innocent non-combatants. Number, number seven, it is forbidden to kill livestock, um, destroy. Can you? Uh, because yeah, he's talking about basically the rules of engagement. This is important, you know, uh, t uh, k killing animals, uh, uh, destroying uh, infrastructure. Uh, he, he goes over um, these important points that, any Muslim who knows the basics of Islam, nowadays you hear the things about ISIS and, you know, Al-Qaeda and all these things, you know, people doing opposite of Islam, these groups set up who, who are a minority and now the people try to make them as a majority and now 
these people who are killing actually more Muslims, the whole Muslim world has come as a consensus against this 0.0019% fringe element. And now this is what sparks these protests in Poland, in other parts of Europe. Now someone does the research and says, no, 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 this is what it's about. You follow me? And then when we look, and uh, you, can, you can comment from here, when people were behind on rules of engagement, we had those rules which actually helped to have an impact on the Geneva Convention. Luke says something. He says something really interesting. Uh, he For said, those that don't know the Geneva Convention, people, some people don't even know what that is. It, it's basically, as far as I know, uh, a set of rules or regulations that guide... In guide how you interact in warfare in war yes and it's 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 rules that should be there right they should yeah so luke says that but that was 19 what 49 that was after world war one after world war one then they yeah. said man we got to put some rules here and this is getting gruesome and ugly you so know luke says luke says something really interesting he goes because of islam or, or you know because of islamic teachings and the sunnah and what have you that you kind of have uh, the Geneva Conventions before the Geneva Conventions. We were the <laughs> Islam was the Geneva con Convention perfect form before that. Right. But see, this is what's so important, people, is that you get educated, that you learn, that you don't let this hate and hate preachers and teachers out there guide and form your perception. This is what's dangerous. This is what creates now this uh, another version of ISIS that's being c created amongst these uh, white supremacists and, 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 and people like this. We don't, we don't support any form of extremism on any side. We don't f support any form of hate mongering, hate speech. Everyone's here to live a peaceful, comfortable life. We want to live in tranquility. We want to spread goodness. We want to talk about goodness. Mind we talk about mindfulness, e healthy eating, worshiping the one creator alone, right? Things that hopefully lead to a good life. One thing that I want to point out because of the things that you just read, um, why is it that there's so many testimonies that Luke has captured in this book from non-Muslim soldiers, soldiers of arms in arms with the Muslims that praise the Muslims? It's because of things like this. When they, when they interacted with the Muslims, they saw that they were living proofs of these very things, not extreme, even keel, uh, charitable. They, you know, I don't know the story verbatim, but there's a story of there was like a chemical attack during the war and a, a chemical attack on the allies and one of the Muslim allied soldiers like, it's like, imagine this as a slow-mo Hollywood scene, right? He runs in trying to save the Allied soldiers. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is amazing. Yeah. Where are these stories now, you know? That reminds me of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, last and final messenger sent to mankind, where he's, during his time, there were the, the non-Muslim, the pagan Arabs, and they were forming a coalition to stand against injustice. And he had commented that if that was alive and going today, I would be part of it. Mm. And this is what we're talking about. Being part of those social mo movements, those movements that are for spreading good. Exactly. Protecting the downtrodden, the oppressed. This is what Islam is about. Another point here is where you see in this picture, there's Muslims not compromising their deen. Look, over here you have the Christians here in the book. They're praying. They're praying. Right. They're doing their thing. As the Prophet Sallallahu peace and blessings be upon him, when he had the dialogue with Christians, he would allow them to go ahead and pray in the mosque, right? Right. right. He allowed them to, to worship how they worship. Here you got Muslims worshiping. that You have them in sajda. You have them in rows, praying like Jesus prays with their heads on the ground, praising the Creator, the one Jesus called to uh, and praised, the one God. What were you going to say? So Luke, Luke told me a fascinating story, and one of the members of this organization is called the Forgotten Heroes Foundation 1419 Hayyan Baba. He, he has a video online where he's talking about some of the stories and it's amazing. So we talk about the Christians and the Jews. There's some also we have to give credit to the, you know, the Sikhs and the Hindus because they fought alongside the Muslims as well. So there's an amazing story where the Germans built a prisoner of war camp and they built a mosque in Germany trying to curry favor the Muslims over to their side. And um, the Hindus were being sent away to other camps where the conditions were very bad and they would die rather quickly. So according to Luke and from what I heard from Hayan, the Muslims were teaching the Hindus on just how to behave a little, like how to outwardly act Muslim just so their lives could be saved. So again, they're saving the Hindus now, the Muslims are, because right. what, the, the Ger Germans? As far as, as far as I know yeah. from, the, you know, from yeah. what Luke and Hayan have told me. But again. And I don't want to, I see, I, I don't like, see, uh, when we say Germans, I mean, We're not picking on the Germans. No, there are Ger there are yeah. Muslims who are German. Yeah. I had an interview with one of the far uh, zealot, you know, Islamophobes, 
uh, not too long ago who was in that far right, that movement of extremism, hate, and he actually accepted Islam, right? We'll put it in context. We're just talking about World War One. We're just talking. We're not, uh, we're not okay. talking about any group. Uh, and like, again, just to reiterate, this is not picking on a certain class of people. A political. Yeah, this is at that time. Okay? Yes, it's in that time, but, uh, and even now, we're not promoting any country, any ideolo ideology, any colonialism, agenda, anything. Uh, yeah, even let's make it clear: the book is not, quote unquote, a propagation tool for Islam. Mm -hmm. It's just giving a voice to soldiers that their story has not been preserved. And even Luke would tell us, it is part of our effort to save the the stories of these soldiers, to save the lives of these intense. Uh, forms of brotherhood, sisterhood, uh, bonds of friendship. You have white, brown, black, Indian, English. There's stories of uh, Somali soldiers fighting for the Allies. So yeah. many of these. I, I, I want to get Luke on the show, and then I want you guys to engage with us. Luke, I, 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 would he engage with us? I, I, which Before camera should I look at? Luke, Luke, Mr. Luke Ferrier, please come to the show. Uh, I think it would be great for you to come. And as far as I know, Luke is willing to come on the show the next time he's in America. Yeah. Uh, right now they are busy promoting an event. It's called um, Singularity of Peace. Even look at the name, Singularity of Peace, and you can go on singularityofpeace.com. And what they're doing, it's it's a Muslim-led initiative where they're calling on hundreds of artists to come to the event to basically talk about peace, make make forms of art about peace, about conflict. And they're calling these artists. They're calling you know young businessmen, entrepreneurs. They're also going to have a section for uh, Black History Month in England. Again, diversity, promotion of, of good values, good material, and, uh, you know, Singularity of Peace will start, I think, in the second week of September. They can find out more information on the website, mm -hmm. I think, which you'll put in the description. There's also the book, The Unknown Fallen. They can find out about the book on unknownfallen.com. And the organization that is behind this is called Forgotten Heroes Foundation. What a beautiful name, the Forgotten Heroes, 1419. And I, I look forward to, God willing, having a look on the program. And just you guys, I want to get you guys involved to get your take on this. There's one more thing before we conclude. Another part on chapter 32 of the book, he talks about officers were surprised. He said the, the people who are not Muslim, they're surprised. Remember, a Muslim is simply one who submits their will to the creator of the heavens and earth. You, if you've been watching the Dean Show, you know that already for those of our guests just tuning in. That's what it means. Officers were surprised when Muslim soldiers lectured them. Okay, now they're lecture, reviving the Sunnah again. Look at that. Lectured them about the fact that captured prisoners of war would be taken to a place that had been prepared for them. They should not harm them or torture them with beating. Right, style? Torture? Mm -hmm. Look, so you shouldn't torture them, beat them, nor harm them, uh, deprive them of food and water, leave them in the sun or in the cold. Can you imagine just, I mean, th just uh, uh, waterboarding and all these things, the debates on burn them with fire or put them, put covers over their mouths, ears and eyes and put them in cages like animals. This is not allowed in Islam. This is not allowed. This is against the teachings of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Even if you have these, the insane state, whatever state doing it, that already exposes to you that this is not a part of Islam. We don't support those. Rather, they should treat them with kindness. What, what do you say? He's talking about this. Very important. Rather, they should treat. Now, this is the, again, paint the picture. Imagine this. These are Muslims teaching this to the not yet Muslims on how they should treat the prisoners that they were just shooting at them. They're in conflict. Now, they caught them prisoners of war. And they're telling them, rather, they should treat them with kindness and mercy and feed them well. Amazing. Then he has a, a quote here. Compassion is the basis of morality. And he also talks about... Um, Something about not separating the children from their families. Oh man, do we have what we have going on today? We got torture, prison debate. Should we not? Should we? Islam is clear on that. He's got beautiful quotes in the book fr from the Quran. He's got beautiful Subhanallah. quotes even from former American presidents. He's got uh, you know there was an amazing quote he had from Gandhi about humanity being humane. So I, I think the book is overall a positive message. Let me ask you, what do you think about the book? I mean, I want. I'm just. I'm just getting into it. I'm. You know, I haven't uh, finished it completely. But when I when I see, like I started off with, when I see the revival of the Sunnah, the way of Jesus, Moses, Abraham, the teachings of mercy and righteousness being highlighted in a world now when we see so much hate being perpetuated, dividing us as humans. We're all brothers 
in humanity. Mm. There's brothers in faith, but then you have brothers in humanity. Now, if we're brothers, we shouldn't be killing one, one another or, or, or hating each other, and Islam doesn't expose that. But the thing now is you see that in Europe. You see this huge movement of it, it's all based on, 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 on false propaganda, on, on hate, right? And ignorance of people. But when you see these things now that are being written by Christians, that are being historical facts that are being brought to light, this needs to be in the hands of people like that so they can rethink their position, be like, hold on, man. People don't like being lied to. Hmm. And many people, the majority of these hate preachers, teachers, they're lying to the people. That's what I always tell people. Like you said, many people don't like being lied to. And from my experience as an American, Americans are very open-minded. Yes, they, yes. They love truth and honesty. I'm one of them, brother. <laughs> We're one of them. We're one of them, yes. So, and they love, they love dialogue and interaction. And this is why... We love that, that's when right. When I met Luke, I said, man, this is, this is from God. Imagine at this time, a non-Muslim, openly non-Muslim, and we have to point that out, promoting the, the, the saving of Islamic history, the saving of these stories of Muslims, Christians, Hindus, Jews, Sikhs. And truth. It's the truth, and that's why. It doesn't he's just promoting the truth. It doesn't have to do with religion at that point. It has to do with the fact that this is true. And you see, he's made it his life's work. He, 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 this makes him tick more than it makes most of us tick. Yeah, yeah. And I've met him uh, once when he came to America. He was at Harvard. Um, he has uh, some, some programs online you know, from other members of his organization. And they're doing this event. I wish I was there. Singularity of Peace. So many people are going to come. The local, uh, the local group, the local government, as far as I know, in, in, in London, it's in Hammersmith. They're behind it. They support it. Young artists, young entrepreneurs. And also, you know, I told you last time I was on the show that I do mentorship. Imagine this. Now they're calling young artists. They're calling young entrepreneurs. They're giving away some of the stalls for free. This is just support, encouragement, dialogue. This is what we should be doing. This is what we should be about. This is how dialogue takes place. This is how we impart and impact positivity. This is how you sleep better at night. People can tick. Something will get you moving. And some people are driven by that fuel of hate. And that you are not falling asleep well with that. Going to bed agitated, aggravated, and all pumped up with all, all of this hate rhetoric. That's not gonna, you're not going to sleep well, brothers and sisters. No way. But the truth, when someone is dedicated to something good, a noble cause, it's, it's premium on Lettin. That it's it's that fuel that really motivates you and brings positive results. Promoting peace, love, mercy, justice, promoting these qualities that bring mankind together rather than dividing us. I, I think there's no follow up to what you just said. I mean that's what that's what life is about. It's about living a life of purpose, sleeping better at night by partaking by getting involved by bettering the community that's why i love what you're doing and i think you're talking somewhere tonight about healthy living and healthy eating i mean what else is there in life i taught esl for uh, numerous years and when you teach esl to uh, those that come to this country and you see the hunger and thirst that they have to learn the language to become a part of the culture to then in turn help by getting better jobs by helping their children what else is there right the, you have to get involved. You have to partake in, in higher projects. And this is why I'm happy to be involved in this project because this is, again, apolitical, a religious, even though it's, it's, it's highlighting the contributions of the Muslims, but it's such a noble effort and such a noble endeavor. I thank Luke. I thank Hayan. I thank my friend Hamid. I thank the rest of the team. Uh, I thank the Forgotten Heroes Foundation. If you want the book, unknownfallen.com, singularityofpeace.com for this event that is coming up in Hammersmith, London. And I'll end with this. This is the beginning of the book, and we'll end with that. There's a quote that says, we may have different religions, different languages, different colored skin, but we all belong to one human race. For any Muslim now, he thinks of the verse in the Quran where God mm. Almighty is talking about that we've made you into different nations and tribes. Mm. Speaking the different, having different colors, speaking different languages, but... It was for a noble purpose that you know each other, not that you despise and hate each other. So let's get rid of the hate, people. Thank you very much for Thank you. being with us. You have the information. Let's create. I'm learning more about this, and I wanted to bring it to your guys' attention. Tell me what you think. Look into it. If you have some questions for Luke, when we get them, God willing, on the show, send them in. 
But make sure you subscribe right now and on the notification bell so you can get that show, God willing, when it comes out. And let's be peaceful. Let's be people who foster goodness, not hate. You got to cut the hate, eradicate it, and promote things that will help you sleep better at night. We'll see you next time. Until then, peace be with you. Assalamu alaikum. Please subscribe to The Dean Show. Follow us on our official Facebook and Twitter pages in the links below. Please also help support The Dean Show by making a donation in the link below.